welcome to another session of Me Crowd, where we are teaching you how capitalism is woman's best friend. And what better woman to talk about these topics than Didre McCloskey. Didre, thank you so much uh, for being here uh, uh, for this chat. And um, I, I wanted to start um, our conversation by asking you about something that Manuela Yao, the founder of Francisco Marroquin University, where you have a doctor honoris causa, uh, he always mm -hmm. clarified that for someone to uh, change one thing for another, for, to trade, first, it has to be their legitimate property. However, yeah. today, private property is seen as immoral and even like useless for yeah. the peaceful uh, atmosphere in a society. So how yeah. can we go back uh, to the notion that without private property, there cannot be legitimate trade. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, uh, it's, it's obvious. If, if nobody owns anything, there's no point in accumulating anything. There's no point in making anything. Then the best thing to do is to go to your, go to your neighbor and steal what she has. <laughs> And everyone steals from everyone else, and n nothing gets made, as the great uh, English philosopher um, Thomas Hobbes said. In such circumstances, without private uh, 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 property somehow enforced, the world becomes a war of all against all. And the life of man, he said, is solitary. Uh, let's see, um, in short, you, so, so yes, you must have uh, um, a, a property in order to trade, but people do resent other people's property. And the only way of, of some want your own property to be stolen, your house to be broken into. So why would you do that to someone else? You know, the, the, it's a, envy is a great sin. But unfortunately, many in, in, in politics, envy is often encouraged, is fed by some to their advantage. They say, oh, look, look at that man there. He's rich. Let's go break into his house and steal his stuff. And it, there, there hasn't been any society on earth that has worked well without private property. All you have to do if you're, if you're, a, if, if you're a Christian, for example, is to, is to look into the Bible and find in the Hebrew Bible and in, in our, our so-called New Testament, the assumption is that there will be private property. That's I can very, hear you, dear. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yes? Yes, that, I can. Thanks. That's a very important notion for you to make because all over Latin America, sometimes Christianity has been used. In fact, uh, uh, Pope yeah. Francis uh, in Catholicism has condemned yeah. private property, has said that's of the, of the Christian. Now, the, by, the way, by, yeah. by the way, by the way, that's a novelty on his part because since um, Leo the Thirteenth. A, hundred and a, a century and a half ago, one pope after another have said private property is better than socialism. Now you have responsibilities to the poor. As a, as a Christian liberal, I certainly, I, I certainly, I certainly believe that. And I, I tithe to my church. I give one-tenth of my income to my church. So it's, that, though, is perfectly consistent with Christianity. And it's Francis who's out of line here. It's, it's good that you, that you mentioned that. Uh, and, and also, uh, talking about, you said, I, I give 10%, uh, but it's your private property. There's also the notion that if there's like this uh, 
absolute capitalism, then it's everyone for their, for their own sake. There's not going to be help or charity. Could you explain to us why private property is also crucial for true charity and true solidarity to exist? Well, sure it is, because if, if my help for the poor is about taxing you, <laughs> not me, but you, and then giving your property to the poor, you, you can see that that doesn't have any ethical weight. Any that's not holy. That's not a good thing to do. Stealing from from Peter to give to Paul is not is not that's not virtuous. But what? So the it's it's um, on. A number of crowns having private property and allowing it to work. Now, if you don't allow it to work, if you put obstacles in it and and um, and it works poorly, then that's another matter. But if it works well, it enriches everyone. In fact, the key point here is that the way people get better off, the way the poor get better off, is by having a more productive economy. Um, if for the poor of, of, of for the poor of, of, of Guatemala to get better off, the 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 income the how can I say it the the productivity of the Guatemalan machine has to get larger, or the pie we always talk that way the pie has to get larger so that the share of the poor is, is higher and that's basically the only way. Because to just take from the rich and give to the poor, although it sounds like it'll work well, it, it, it doesn't achieve what it wants to achieve. And, and, and the reason is quantitative. The poor person, a poor person in Guatemala can move to the United States if he, if he can somehow get to the United States and can earn 10 times more than he earns in Guatemala, 10 times more. That's an indication of how much better off the poor people of Guatemala could be if they allowed the economy to work as it works in the United States. So, you know, it's, it's the, the kind of shortcut, the socialist, uh, the progressive shortcut of stealing from the poor, and I mean from the rich, well, sometimes from the poor too, but from for, for the rich in order to give to the poor is not a smart idea. Yeah, and, and, and on that sense specifically, uh, David Bowes, who quotes, um, who is quoted by Tom Palmer in his book, uh, Realizing Freedom, he says, it is necessary for us to cooperate within trade and that we have justice uh, rules, especially the ones that go hand in hand with private property and trade. So they define how we can do that trade. Now these rules establish who has the right to decide how to use uh, their portion of property. Now, why right. is there no cooperation that can be ethical cooperation without yeah. those rights, uh, especially understanding that a basic human right is a right to private property. That's a, all that is right is true. And I, for, and I forgot to mention it in what, what I said uh, uh, 30 seconds ago, which is that the markets, the markets, the markets, uh, the market system, where I voluntarily give you my labor and you voluntarily give in the same trade some of yours and we're both better off, positive sum, that is social cooperation. It's most of social cooperation. Now to be sure, among friends or in a family, much of the cooperation takes the form of, of, uh, 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 of giving things 
to your son or to your brother or to your friend. And that's fine. I'm not against that. I'm all for it. But in, in what uh, the great economist Hayek called the great society, the whole of the whole of Guatemala or the United States or the world, this deep, <laughs> this, how can I say, this massive cooperation that goes on, when you buy a pencil, famous example, you hold up a pencil. How many people are, I'll hold up a pen, see. <laughs> how many people worked to make this pen? And I bought it for very little. Well, it turns out to be thousands of people work for it. Right. From all over the world. Now, my word, what cooperation. And by the way, a kind of cooperation that can't be planned from the center. It, people think, well, it's a, a country's like a household. Therefore, just as mama plans the meal for tonight, the central planners can plan the economy. But in fact, without private uh, uh, property and the markets that it, it gives rise to, this couldn't get made because people wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know how valuable the steel was or the ink, and they wouldn't know how to make it, and it, it, they wouldn't know where to send it. Somehow, you know, if you want a bottle of milk, you go to the corner store, and miraculously, there is a bottle of milk for you. <laughs> yeah. And you give a little bit of your labor, little teeny bit, and you get the bottle of milk. It's miracolo. It's incredible. Yeah. And it comes from private property. It can't be done. It, it essentially can't be done any other way because the knowledge that you need to make even so simple a thing as a pen is, is as Hayek said, dispersed all over the place. And the only way to get it together is not by some genius in Washington or London or something thinking, oh, yes, here's how you make a pen. No, no. It has to be done by this um, uh, not it's spontaneous is how it's often said, but anyway, this cooperation. So capitalism is cooperative. And, and that is so, uh, so true uh, for pens, for cell phones, for milk, for almost every product that we have. We don't know who are uh, all the people involved in creating those things that we benefit thanks to the market. And that is exactly the reason why, uh, for example, my crowd uh, works not telling women how they should invest their money, what businesses are good, but giving them the tools, making That's also them responsible for that. But they are the ones, they are the engineers behind it. It's not that notion of uh, the UN or the central planners of this white man's burden of teaching the rest how to do it. That's right. I, I think that that's been one of the great mistakes in post-war. I mean, ever since World War II, post-war foreign aid. But it often comes in the form of, I'm an, I'm an agronomist from Iowa State University, and I come to you, you ignorant peasant farmer in Guatemala, and I tell you what to do. And you better follow me because I'm an expert. Well, as you say, the uh, are used small to buy uh, a homemade cloth, for example, to, to, to sell again, or are, uh, um, are, are, are renting a cell phone so that people can call their, their family in the United States, or any other little thing that they're, they're, they have what I call local knowledge. They know what their neighbors need, 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 I don't like the word need, want, and are prepared to give some of their labor in order to get. And they don't know it in Guatemala City. They can't possibly know whether in some remote village they want, they, what their, their greatest d desire is to rent a cell phone for a 15-minute conversation. 
So you're absolutely right. It's it, it, the, the key is to, I, I've started to think of it th this way. The key to a free society is permission. Equality of permission. We tend to say equality of opportunity. I, I don't think that's quite the point. The, the, because, you know, come on, some people are short, some people are tall, some people are, are, uh, are you know, have this advantage or this disadvantage. It's not so much we want to equalize everyone at the outset, but we don't want to stop them from doing things. If this woman that you give a loan to wants to start a small factory in her, uh, in her village that makes, I don't know, pots or something or uh, some kind of nice dress, um, you can't have someone from the government or from the trade union or from another competitor stopping her. It's permission that's the key. And that should be equal. Equal for men, equal for, 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 for women, equal, equal, equal. And, and, and uh, one concern that comes, let's, let's say that we agree on the equality of permission. Some people have the concern that when, whenever there is trade in between two cultures, inevitably one culture is going to dominate over the other and kill that, uh, that other culture. When in fact, they both can coexist and they benefit uh, right. precisely because of that idiosyncrasy, particularly To, con to focus on certain uh, goods that can be attractive for others uh, that they don't have the conditions, maybe geographically or, or, or uh, of technology or weather conditions to produce yeah. certain goods that the other culture yeah. can have. Now, why is it so hard to understand that with, with, with trade, it's not about in, like forcing everybody to something. That's the trouble. But that they both benefit. That's the problem. People really don't believe that. And I think, I think the reason they don't believe it is this. Whenever you buy something, a quart of milk or a, or a, you know, a, a, a necklace, unfortunately, these are not real pearls, I have to admit it. Uh, <laughs> uh, when, 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 when you buy anything, the other person, the person who sold it to you, could have given it to you at a lower price and vice versa when i bought the pearls the pearls the pearls quotation marks the pearls i would have been prepared to pay a little bit more right so on both the supply and the demand there's this kind of annoyance that the other person didn't give me a better deal and people feel this more or less every time they buy something. And then there's a kind of, um, that, that I think arouses people's uh, anger and annoyance. They're, they're annoyed at trade. So, and that, that's, why it's, that's why it's so easy for, um, for the claim to be made of unequal trade. And that we need fa fair trade, not, and not free trade. Right. And, and, It's not true. Trade is trade is trade. It makes both people better off or they wouldn't do it, would they? <laughs> exactly. And, and that's precisely the tendency that then uh, drives certain people to say we have to protect the markets. But when you protect, you only benefit the ones that are already in power, the ones that are privileged, the friends of the government, never to the people who would actually need it, which are the consumers that have to, you know, conform themselves with scarcity, with super high prices, with bad quality right. products. That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that, that, that certainly happens. And it happens in Latin America and has happened a great deal, especially again since the war. A um, lot of a lot of Latin American countries, not Guatemala as much as many, have gone to what they call import substitution, where local producers of automobiles, for example, in Brazil or Argentina, are are protected, and then so you so Ford Motor 
or, or uh, General Motors or something can't import into those countries. And that's, that's crazy because what, it, what, what protection is, if it's done with a fist, with the violence of the government behind it, which it has to be or it's not going to work, is to take from one part of the economy and give to the other. And that doesn't make people better off. It makes one group, in fact, as you say, quite generally, it makes consumers much worse off. Way back in the 1970s, there were quotas on Japanese automobiles coming into the United States. Only a certain number were allowed to come in because the American automobile companies didn't like having these Japanese automobiles. Well, the result was an increase in the average price of automobiles, Japanese and American, of $100,000 for every job that was saved in Detroit. So you protected the workers in Detroit, making um, $20,000 or less a year, maybe 15,000 a year, at the cost of $100,000 of damage to the consumers. So it's not, it's a, it's a foolish thing to do, but it's very tempting because you look at one part of the economy and forget about the rest. Yeah, the, the, the seen and the unseen that Bastiat used to say, unfortunately the consumers right. are dispersed, so it is harder right. to see the loss on their side. That's exactly right. I, I once um, said, and I think it's true, <clears throat> that in order to do an economic analysis correctly, you have to get the social accounting right. You have to have not just this, this little piece of the economy, and we're going to look at that, see if we can make that better, but you have to have the whole economy in mind so that you know that if, you're, if all you're doing is making these pe people better off and hurting all these people, that's not smart. It's not good accounting. One of the things I enjoy so much talking with you is that uh, you come up with this uh, great notions like uh, equality on, on permissiveness rather than the opportunity yeah. and, and also, That's you know, that uh, uh, getting the social accounting right. Uh, you've declared... Oh, yeah. Sorry? What's that? Uh, no, that, that I love that about like the notions that, that you have uh, come up with and, and enriched the debate. Um, you've declared in one of your articles from the Financial Times that in relative terms, the poor are, have, have been the, the principal and, and the major beneficiaries of this accelerated process of growth since the yeah. Industrial Revolution, uh, yeah. that billions of people have access to gas for cooking, to automobiles, to vaccines against uh, different diseases, uh, uh, water that can actually be uh, drinkable, uh, more adequate nutrition, even height, um, in, in, in increments in uh, uh, heights and also life expectancy even schooling for their kids but yeah. how did we do that and more interesting yet uh, where the, the the ideas came from in order to achieve those um, uh, successes well it, it's key that there be ideas look at my I'm in my apartment in Chicago you can see my apartment is 13 stories tall. It was made in 1912. And this is reinforced concrete. This is concrete, which the Chinese had and the Romans had. That's very old. But the idea was once we got cheap steel in the middle of the 19th century, some guy turned out to be a, uh, the owner of a garden in France, thought, well, hmm, suppose we put steel inside the concrete. And sure enough, it made the concrete a, a good substitute for, say, steel. It could, you could support a, a building, as mine is, with reinforced concrete. So the idea is the key. The guy who invented containerization in 1956 owned a trucking firm in North Carolina in the United States. His name was Malcolm, M M M M M Malcolm, M M Malcolm McLean. And the idea wasn't very fancy. It didn't involve science. He just said, no, let's see. Hmm. Suppose we made standardized steel boxes, great big ones. 
and sent put goods in them and sent that to China. <laughs> and then the Chinese could fill it up and send it back. Hey, great idea. And it completely transformed international transportation. The idea of the steam engine is pretty simple. And, and so there all, all these ideas, now you ask, where do the ideas come from? And the answer is that they come from people. They don't come from exploitation. They don't come from stealing from people. They don't come from uh, governmental projects on the whole. They came from individuals thinking up reinforced concrete or containerization or hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of other things that make our lives um, better off. How much? better off about now hear this 3000 percent better off than in 1800 wow and this is as true in in guatemala as it is in the united states true the united states has a higher income than the average person in guatemala but still in 1800 <laughs> people in guatemala were much poorer than they are now because as you said they didn't have vaccines, they didn't have clean milk, they didn't have good water, they didn't have any kind of education, blah, 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 blah. So where did it come from? Well, it came from liberty. It came from allowing people, as the English say, there's an English expression, to have a go, which means to try something out, to venture, to go forward. Ah, let's try it out. That came from free people. It's not going to come from a traditional society, you know, gripped by its structures of authority. It's not going to come from a centralized planning, central planning economy. It's not going to come from government projects from above. It comes from below, it comes from all the little people. Um, and I think, you know, they, they, I, I know that in, in Guatemala, there's a problem of um, rather strong discrimination against the Indios. And that's really foolish because it's not the case that one race or another is smarter. If, if, you, if you give permission to Na Native Americans, they're just as enterprising as everyone else. Say, oh no, that's not true. I, I know, I know they're not. And it's that's that's wrong. It's it's the it's the surrounding society's permission that makes for this well, that is liberty. It's um, we have a problem in English because we have, as we often do, we we have two words. We have freedom and, and liberty. One comes from the Germanic side of our language, and the other, through French, comes from our Romance side, like as in Spanish. And the problem with freedom is it's gotten connotations of abilities. My friend Amartya Sen, the great economist, talks about development as freedom. And that's a mistake. It's freedom, or it's, no, I keep using, you use the wrong word. It's, it's liberty from human coercion that gives people the, the, the ability to have a go and to invent stuff. And, and it, it, I can show this. I've shown it in uh, my books. Precisely, that was going to be my, my further question. You wrote a book called A Formula for a Richer World, and you already gave us some of the ingredients, but can we talk a, a little bit about uh, what that formula contains? Well, uh, it's sort of dangerous to use the word formula. I think that may be from a, from a Spanish translation, because I wouldn't have used such a phrase. Because formula suggests something with, with rigid, proportions like H2O, 
formula for water. Right, and, right. And the fact is that if you let people try things out, and if you, so, if so, you, sorry, Deidre, to interrupt. Would you like me to say the the title in English as it is, so we don't sure. get an okay? Uh, That's okay. So, so what what is it, an article? Actually, I I don't know why the translation. Uh, this is one of the questions that was sent uh, through me through Alejandro. What uh, an article called the formula for a richer world. He translated it, uh, uh, which was equality, liberty, and justice. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And but, but that's that's Adam Smith's formulation. Okay. Uh, I, call, I call him the blessed Adam Smith because I think he should be a saint. Right. In the Catholic Church. Okay. And, 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 and th that's how he expressed it. Right. Equality, liberty, and justice. And what he meant by that is social equality, e economic economic liberty. If you want to open you know, a grocery store or something, go ahead, and equality before the law. So it's, it's e equal, that's what's interesting about it. It's equality. Our friends on the left say, oh, I'm for equality, but they really aren't for equality of uh, uh, these equalities. They, they think they, that, uh, that equality means handing stuff out as though you're in a family or in a group of friends equally. And that's, that's not, that's not the important form of liberty or, or, or justice or equality. And precisely because of that in Latin America, what we have is instead of equality, inequality of, uh, ex except uh, uh, actually in fact is uh, inequality under the law. Not everybody is equal uh, in, in the yeah, right. That's terrible. And then you and have- that, we, we have that problem in the United States too. Yeah. That's what the Bl Black Lives Matter movement is all about that's what they say that's what these that's what the civil rights movement that's what the that's what votes for women that all these things are about equality that's what gay marriage is about is equality right and and instead of also having liberty you have oppression and we talked a little bit about that in in the latin american context and instead of justice you have impunity so it's like it is not a formula. It's just uh, having the right principles in order to have a That's society right. that can flourish. And it is, uh, yeah. and it's sometimes so hard because the data is there. Hans Rosling uh, talked about, you know, 200 years in oh, 200 yeah. countries. And it's a, an amazing example. But it seems to me that nowadays people focus 10% uh, of the bad news, they give it 90% of their attention, uh, whereas 90% of, you know, good things going on in the world, they don't get 10% of the attention. I agree with you, and that, that's a problem. I've, I actually just had an um, interview with El Globo in uh, Brazil, and that's one of the points I made. He said, look, you, you, uh, you journalists, have to stop doing just what you say. I said, look, the great, the biggest story, economic story in the modern world is continuing economic growth. It's, it's in the world as a whole, income per head is going up at about 2% a year per person in real terms and has been for a long time. Now you think 2%, gee, that's not very much. In, in a century, that's eight times the so something growing at two percent in a hundred years gets to be eight times higher than it is now. Now imagine Guatemala with eight times more income per head than it has now. It would be in great shape. Right. So it, it, it's it, it, whereas the kind of short run problem. Oh, the the COVID. Obviously, the COVID is a serious problem, the COVID infection, that's a problem. And uh, all the, the great re recession in, 19, in 2008, and oh, inequality, and oh, this, and all that. And the, the, the journalists are, are, are missing, not on purpose, it's not, they're not conspiring, but they're focused on the, on the local present problem 
and not thinking, not seeing the forest, so to speak. They're looking at the trees, and they don't see the forest getting bigger and bigger and bigger all around them. And it's, it's this kind of thing that you're involved in, um, allowing ordinary poor women to enter the economy in a serious way. That's, that's what your, uh, your program um, does. And if you keep doing that, eventually you're going to end up with eight times more than you have now. Now, there is a, an interest in, in, in sometimes maintaining the status quo because as we were talking, uh, the, the benefits of the, of the small group who are benefiting of not having uh, free trade and private property rights are, are better for them. But, but, but yeah, if you think of the, of the large scale, we would all be better off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on and, that. And, and, and I think even the current rich would be better off. I mean, it's not, it's not the case that what I call the great enrichment, which is much bigger than the, than the Industrial Revolution, it's the continuation that made for a tremendous change, that made even the rich better off. They got electric lights in their houses and they got big automobiles. But of course, <laughs> it was more important for the poor people to get enough to eat and to learn to read. Um, so I think the percentage increase in the welfare of ordinary people in the great enrichment was very much larger than it was for the rich people. Um, some very rich person gets another yacht. So now she doesn't have one yacht, she has two yachts. Well, okay. Right, yeah. So what? <laughs> <laughs> Deidre, it has been such a pleasure and an honor to have you here in this uh, My Crowd Sessions. And uh, I want uh, really to thank you for, for your amazing work with you all over the world. And before letting you go, I would like you to share with our audience how can they follow more of your work, read your publications, your amazing books, your conferences, how that they can find you on the internet. It's very easy. Just you have to spell my name right. That's the only problem. Deirdre, D E I R D R E, McCluskey, M C C L O S K E Y. If you get that right, you go on the internet and you'll get get to my my my, my very good uh, web page. I call it good because I had nothing to do with it. I, some I, someone else designed it and someone else maintains it, but it's very full. It's got speeches and articles and even it's got a uh, it's, it's it's got a uh, my old microeconomics book on it if you want that so it's got all kinds of things thank you very much for sharing that and for everybody here this was Deirdre McCloskey thank you so much for sharing this my crowd sessions where we're learning why capitalism is the best friend for women see you next time yes it is yes for me and you. <laughs>